Och den här första delen av förmiddagen handlar ju väldigt mycket om 3D. Och vi ska ha en talare som är med oss på en länk. Och därför ska jag ställa mig bredvid dig nu. Och I'm trying to introduce you and I'm also talking about what is going to happen for the rest of this day. And um, it's a lot about technical. You can see the audience now, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. And you are Alexi Karen Karenovska. Did I pronounce that right? Perfect, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Do you work at the Institute for Digital Archaeology? which is a joint venture between Harvard University, the University of Oxford and Dubai Future Foundation. And you promote the development and use of digital imaging and 3D printing techniques in archaeology, epigraphy, art history and museum conservation. And we are so interested in your speech, which is about million image database, right? And where are you now? Can you hear me at all? No. <laughs> We're connecting again. So you, I think you can consider the stage is yours. I think you can consider it working now. No? You can't hear me, can you? Yeah, absolutely. Very clear. That's great. That's the problem. It's because I'm too far away from the microphone. You, you think you, I think you can start your speech right now. Try it and we'll see okay. what's happening. Ready uh, to go? Yes. Super, wonderful. So, um, as I say, it's a huge pleasure to be here, um, virtually at least. Um, and I'm, not, I'm very sorry not to be able to, uh, to join you in person. Um, so I want to talk this afternoon, um, as you kindly introduced me, um, one of the subjects of the talk is going to be our large-scale million image database uh, project. But I would actually like to speak a little bit more generally about the role of digital technologies in history and cultural heritage um, and how the projects that we at the Institute for Digital Archaeology fit into this bigger picture. So, um, first of all, a quick introduction if we move on to the next slide there. The Institute for Digital Archaeology uh, is an organization which is devoted to the use of technology um, in the preservation, documentation, restoration, reconstruction um, of cultural heritage objects, and also, importantly, um, the education, education in the area of cultural heritage, and the uh, improvement or uh, looking at new approaches to the appreciation and celebration of cultural heritage. So um, the Institute for Digital Archaeology, as has already been described, is a, a sort of academic consortium based both in the UK at the University of Oxford and also in the United States. And myself and the organization's executive director, Roger Michael, are working currently on a range of projects which are really very um, international indeed. So. What I want to do, as I say, uh, is to speak a little bit generally about what digital technology and digital culture means for cultural heritage. And if we move on to the next slide, um, I want to start that conversation by posing some very basic questions. So firstly, you know, what is history? Um, and what is cultural heritage? And what does it mean to talk about the future of these two concepts? Because it's not, we don't necessarily associate history and culture or make that connection between history and culture and the future. And indeed, this is a very important thing to do if we're going to understand the role of technology um, in, in those two things, in history and culture. And I think when we, when we think about the, the link between history, cultural heritage and, uh, and the future and the various new things that we can do, it's very tempting to focus completely on the technology. So what new technologies can do for our appreciation of history and culture. It's tempting to think about the new, for example, digital uh, 3D technologies that allow us to model, to map, to collect information uh, about technologies that can help us to understand history in an interactive way, etc. But one of the points that I want to make most strongly today is that uh, it's important to start with, uh, with, with 
looking at what the the core where the core of history and culture reside and this is not in technology and its application but rather it's in concepts like identity it's in concepts like citizenship and community and connection with objects uh, with histories with traditions it's has an the, the, there's an interesting connectivity with things like uh, attitudes to subjects and objects, with attitudes to truth, to originality and to authenticity. And there is also obviously a very strong li link to politics, to current affairs, to the way that people perceive themselves in the past, the present and the future. Now, our organization works both with looking at intangible and tangible cultural heritage and the link between those two things and what technology can do to help to explore them more fully or in interesting ways in the future. If we look at the next slide, um, one of the concepts that crops up when we, when we, when we look at these, uh, these issues is that of the monument. Um, and what I want to do is to spend a few minutes linked to the conversation we were just having about the, the, what cultural heritage is, what its future might mean. I want to talk a little bit about what a monument is and what it means to people, because monuments are central to this, uh, the, the activities that we are doing uh, in the area of cultural heritage uh, appreciation, etc. So it's tempting to think of a monument just as a physical object, you know, as a, as a, as a piece of stuff uh, that has been around for a long time. But more crucially, what it is is a seat of memory. So it is something that provides a backdrop to people's experience, experiences. It's a, it offers a kind of pan-generational experience. It's something that you know, our ancestors experienced, our grandparents. Um, and that we experience as individuals that we might aspire for our grandchildren to experience. Monuments provide uh, the center of communities. They offer a, a, a source of identity to individuals, and they provide, importantly, a symbol of shared values, of shared memories, and they have a, a concreteness, a longevity, a kind of immortality to them, which makes them special to us as individuals. And these are properties which no amount of technology can supplant or reproduce. But what technology can do is help us to explore these different elements of what makes monuments special and, and in so doing help us to explore different elements of what makes cultural heritage special to us as individuals and what and help us to share that kind of celebration with people all over the world. So if we now move to the next slide. Um, the, obviously one of the reasons why cultural heritage has become such a prominent topic of conversation recently um, is the growing use of the censorship of cultural objects as a tool um, in, uh, as in, in, by aggressive groups um, in conflicts who want to, by obliterating uh, people, objects of, that, that have cultural significance, exercise control over groups of people. And on this slide, on the, at the top left there, you can see uh, the archaeologist uh, Khalid al-Assad, um, who was very sadly uh, killed uh, at the Palmyra site uh, in 2015, essentially because he was working towards uh, protecting and preserving Syria's cultural heritage. And you can see at the bottom of the slide there, the, uh, that is a, a clip showing the devastation of the ancient temple of Baal Shemin, again on the same site. So these are all, unfortunately, pictures which are very familiar to us. We've all seen them in the media. The question is, how do we respond to them and what can we learn um, about what's going on and how we as individuals who are involved in, in digital technology might contribute to uh, to, to, to a better future, to perhaps preventing these things from happening, um, but also perhaps more importantly, to the project of restoring people's hope in the future and keeping people connected with their heritage. So if we look at the next slide, um, I've just used three words here and a, a, a reproduction of the, uh, the, the distressing picture on the previous slide, um, really to reinforce the fact that these interventions by 
terrorist organizations are about two things more than anything else. They're about show demonstrations of power. They're about obtaining publicity uh, rather than being about any kind of very strong religious ideology. And the third word there, technology, um, is to, uh, to make the point that these, this, the, these, uh, the process by which this power can be exercised, this publicity can be obtained, is actually embedded in technology. So the fact that these individuals are able to cause such devastation and destruction to these ancient sites is actually, and sadly, uh, a result of the fact that technology has evolved in such a way as to make that possible, which makes it, I think, all the more appropriate that we, if you like, fake back in a peaceful way with the digital technologies um, that you know we that exist in the uh, in the 21st century. So, if we look at the next slide, I'm going to explore a little bit more the Palmyra site. Uh, it's one which we, as an organisation, have worked on extensively over the last 18 months, um, and also one that I think people will be familiar with. So it's helpful to, um, to, to, to get our bearings by looking at the, the objects on that site. So Palmyra uh, is a, a, a very important site um, deep in the deserts of, of Syria. Um, it is a crossing point of civilizations, a site which has been built up over uh, hundreds of years, um, in fact, thousands of years, and contains very, a very interesting mixture of ancient Babylonian um, uh, Arabic um, and Roman influences. Now, as unfortunately we will be, uh, most people will be uh, all too familiar with, the site has been very badly damaged, um, and you can see there a, 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 a very striking before and after picture of the Temple of Baal, the large uh, temple on the site, um, which has been uh, almost completely obliterated by uh, by the terrorist actions there over the last over the last year. The next slide shows it in a little bit more detail. Now, what we've been doing as an organisation um, is several things. One is the Million Image Database uh, program, which was uh, mentioned in the introduction. If we look at the next slide, this shows an example um, of the kind of image that we are gathering. And through this project. So it's a project which is putting digital photography in the hands of volunteers working um, in country um, in the uh, across the Middle East, in fact, across the world. And the idea is by uh, empowering local people with digital technology, we can create a kind of digital seed bank of images of sites that are at risk um, or already have been already damaged or destroyed, which can then be used subsequently to inform people about the sites, to aid scholarship, and also um, as a potential aid to restoration or reconstruction. So if we look at the next slide, um, this is uh, just shows the online portal that we have um, through which images are accessible. Um, the next slide, I think, uh, the, the following slide shows uh, how this is navigated. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of location-based um, system. Uh, there, is, there are many images online at the moment, but it, the archive is very much in its infancy. So we have a, a huge store of images which are um, in progress. If we look at the next slide, um, I'm going to spend a few minutes now talking about how these two-dimensional images, um, some of them taken in 3D form. So you see the, the photograph that I showed you earlier is actually an anaglyph. It's one of these red-green images that contains depth information about the structure. And these are very useful um, as a basis for forming 3D models of structures. And these 3D models can either be used to produce small-scale physical reproductions of objects, or they can be used to produce large-scale reconstructions, as we'll see later. So if we now look um, at the slide here where we're showing the archway um, from the Temple of Baal in, um, in Palmyra, uh, you can see the first stage of the modeling process in the top right there is to create a very basic outline structure um, in the, uh, sorry, the top right, uh, Top, top right, yeah. Bottom right um, shows the structure fully rendered with all of the surface detail, uh, which is gathered from, uh, from photographs. And finally, on the bottom left there, you can see uh, the archway rendered um, in three-dimensional form with all of the color information obtained completely from, um, from photographs from this large-scale database that we have.
Um, we can flick through, so the next two slides um, show the, how that process works. Um, this is a computer screenshot of the modeling process. And you can see that uh, this is the, the, what you're looking at is a wireframe model of that structure. And where the little green points of light intersect, each point of intersection shows a, 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 a position from which a photograph has been gathered. And there are a few hundred photographs that have been used to model this particular structure. So producing very high quality three-dimensional models from this photographic information is one important means in which we can, if you like, resurrect these structures when they've been damaged or, or destroyed. Looking at the next slide, um, so this shows a rendering of another arch, the triumphal arch um, from the Palmyra site. And indeed, it's that structure which has brought me to, uh, to, to Florence today. Um, you can see a rendering of that structure in Trafalgar Square. That's the National Gallery um, behind it. Um, and on the next slide, um, what you can see is a, a, a couple of photographs showing the 3D carving process, which we as an organization are working on as a tool to convert those computer-based 3D models, like you saw um, in the form of the, the structure in front of the National Gallery in London, um, into actual physical renditions of these ancient structures. So this is a process which can be combined with uh, architectural 3D printing to very rapidly um, and very effectively recreate intricate surface detail such as that that we find on the beautiful decorated structures of Palmyra. So there are, as I say, a couple of construction photographs there. On the next slide, um, on the left-hand side, you can see the arch going up um, in Trafalgar Square. So we actually installed it, not just virtually, but actually in Trafalgar Square in April um, 2016. And on the right-hand side, you can see the structure going up in City Hall Park in New York. So that was a public installation that we did uh, in September. Um, the next slide uh, shows a, uh, a panoramic view of Trafalgar Square. Um, on the 19th of April last year, where we, uh, we launched this phase of the project, the first big public installation. Um, I think you can see the crowd there, several thousand people, um, I think is a real testimony to how much people care um, about cultural heritage, how this is a concept which can unite people you know, across the world, uh, how this can be a valuable and very powerful gesture of hope against the backdrop of obviously a very challenging uh, situation. And I think also, you know, for those of us who are interested in science and technology, this is also a wonderful endorsement um, of people's enthusiasm for you know, what can be done in a sensitive and exciting way um, to help to restore people's, uh, people's uh, connection with their culture and help to keep people's traditions alive. So looking at the next slide there, some more photographs. So again, that's uh, Trafalgar Square. Again, a beautiful sunny day. We were very lucky there. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you can see the structure again, uh, now fully built in City Hall Park, uh, rather beautifully fa framing uh, City Hall in New York. Um, the next slide uh, shows a little bit of interaction with the arch. Um, so one of the interesting things about these public installations has been observing uh, you know, how people are able to explore these objects, obviously completely out of context, but at the same time um, in, a, in such a way as to form a strong connection with them through their understanding of their significance. So you can actually see there's a young girl uh, leaning up against the arch in City Hall there eating her sandwiches. Um, and on the right hand side there, you know, rather a nice picture of a young chap with his young son, you know, explaining the arch and, and why it's there. Um, so the, the structure has also uh, traveled to the Middle East. On the next slide, you can see it going up in Dubai. Uh, so last month, we were privileged uh, to take it out to the World Government Summit in Dubai. Um, it's a very uh, beautiful setting and also one which is of um, some significance uh, for our, um, through our regional partnership with the Dubai Future Foundation. Um, and it's obviously very helpful and significant for us to have uh, a base in the Middle East and so much uh, support from, uh, from the government of the United Arab Emirates. On the next slide there, you can see uh, there's a nice photograph of um, 
of the unveiling. So the Emir of Dubai is there together with the Director General of UNESCO, uh, Rina Bokova, um, and actually the Director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, um, is also there. So it's a project which has brought together people you know, truly from all across the world. Um, the next slide, I think we can uh, we can breeze over. So that is uh, that's the team there in Dubai um, in front of the arch. Um, finally, uh, the the installation in Florence. Um, that's on the next slide. Um, as I said, uh, we're here for the G7 Cultural Summit. And again, um, if we slip over to the next slide, I think that there is. Uh, so this was in one of the uh, the national newspapers. Uh, the 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 role the significance of this structure as a symbol of peace and solidarity with people in the region as well as a, uh, a you know a structure which represents a technological achievement has been a very strong uh, sort of thread through the narrative and one which is extremely important to us as a you know as an organization so finally i will wrap up in a few minutes but the next slide shows an important uh, component of the work that we're doing, and that is education. So we have an initiative called the Future Opportunity Exchange, uh, which is all connected with um, educational activities at all age levels. So from, you can see here, there are some uh, very young children uh, who are enjoying some mosaic making. Um, they were very, very serious about that. Uh, this was these pictures were taken on Trafalgar Square last spring, and we're also working through obviously up to the postgraduate level with people um, in universities internationally who are interested in developing um, technology for. Uh, cultural heritage preservation, but also in exploring the themes and the, uh, the, 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 the community imperative, if you like, that is connected with the application of these new technologies to this area. Uh, so finally, on the next slide, um, I will uh, we'll sort of wrap up with a little bit of a, a little bit of a summary. So what I hope I've done is talked a little bit about um, how the, the importance of thinking not just about history and cultural heritage as things which exist in the past, but as things that have a future. And also the importance of thinking of us as individuals who are interested in digital technologies and in the digital future, of people who are participating in the future of that history. So this is not a situation where we have some sort of discrete history that exists in the past and then some sort of future that involves a weak interaction with it. What we're part of is a continuous narrative, one which started, you know, if we're thinking about these ancient sites 2,000 years ago, and continues to the present day. And that's a narrative, that's a conversation which has, for which new technology is obviously very important, but also, um, but the, the key thing is to recognize that what we're really invested in is not the future of technology and the development of the technology in and of itself, but rather it's the future of experience, the future of authenticity and our relationship with it, and the future of our identity as human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was really interesting. Um, I think most of us actually have thought about cultural heritage as something to, to preserve, not to recreate and hopefully we won't have to recreate so much of it. Uh, I won't allow any questions because I don't think I can handle it <laughs> in a technical way. And uh, I know that you, your schedule is tight and so are ours, but we will put some money on the um, uh, United Nations Help Organ for Kids uh, who, who, to help them learn how to read and write when they're running from war and um, terror organizations. And thank you so much, and hope you have a pleasant stay for the rest of the time in Florence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.